So thank you very much for the invite. Um, I'm amazed by the work that the Friends of Tokai do. And um, it was really interesting to sit through your AGM and listen to what's going on. Tremendous amount of work um, happening and over the 10 years and the work that's been done. So really, uh, I commend the work that you're doing. It's, it's really wonderful. Okay, so on to, to my talk. Um, so restoring the wild wisdom and reclaiming the narrative of wild bees. Maybe some people might not know why would I choose that title? Because most people understand honeybees um, in, in this kind of context. I don't think many people think of bees living in the wild and how they live in the wild. So most people think of honeybees in a box and many conservation organizations also think of honeybees in a box. And it's been quite surprising over the eight years we've been doing research that we come across this kind of perception about bees. Somewhere along the line, they haven't been considered as wild animals. And um, this perception that you save honeybees by putting them in a box. So let's have a look at that. <clears throat> I think the slide says it all. Um, we all know what habitat loss means. And we talk about habitat loss in terms of a landscape and a great amount of, of um, environment that relates to habitat. But actually, if you take honeybees and you put them into a box, they've lost the habitat. And I want to go right into that habitat, their home, and it's not called an, a hive. A hive is what people make. It's called a nest in the wild. So let's have a look at these wild nests. The architecture of um, honeybees in, in the wild is varied. They make their nests according to the specific environment that they're in. So we do research all over, um, all over South Africa now, but um, mostly in the Western Cape and mostly in Table Mountain National Park and more specifically Cape Point Nature Reserve. So <clears throat> we spend a lot of time in the field. Um, that's the question I'm often asked, how much time do you spend? So we spend sort of eight hours a day, um, probably six days a week um, with wild bees watching what they do and how they fit in. So you have this extraordinary architecture, no two nests are the same, and they are adapted to each specific biome and area. So what you probably noticed now is a lot of this dark substance, it's propolis. Um, this nest, that little black hole up at the top, um, I don't know, can't really see, my cursor is not on the screen, but there's a little black hole at the top of that nest and the bees come in and out of that, that hole. So this propolis is very prevalent in wild colonies and in their nest sites. And it has many functions. And I'm limited in terms of my time this evening. Otherwise I could go on for hours about each of these aspects, but propolis is probably one of the most important things in terms of um, construction of a nest. So I want to spend a, quite a bit of time talking about um, the propolis. So in this image here, you can see the nest on, on your left-hand side, and then those are thermal images of, of the nest. And honeybees have to keep their um, babies, their larvae, um, at 34, 35 degrees temperature. If that temperature changes, there can be um, problems with the development of the young bees and they can be born with deformities, which means they will walk out of the nests and end their lives. So it's very important that they maintain that temperature. So you can see in this image, the brightest um, color, the sort of light yellow and the middle image, it's a more orangey color. That's where the heat is. So you can see where the propolis is um, on the left-hand side and the prevailing wind is coming from that left-hand side. It will act in this case to, to protect um, the colony from the wind, 
but it has a much more important um, role. If you can understand a, a colony of bees as, as a superorganism, they, they um, act together um, as, so the, the comb would be like their backbone, they have um, immune bees that perform immune functions, but their young are the only species on the planet that don't have an immune system. So they really have to look after um, their young in their nests. So this is where propolis plays a profound role in that the bees that go and collect the resins from plants, um, plants produce resins to protect their buds or if they've been injured, they release um, resins and the resins are to mostly repel insects. And here's a little insect that has learned to harvest that because it has essential oils that in, in the resins that are very, very, very healthy for the bees. So in a wild colony, you have a bee that is born to just do that job. And this is a very, very important um, factor that when bees are in hives, there are fewer and fewer of these resin collecting bees um, because they don't put as much propolis down in, in a box compared to what they do in the wild. So she's born to this job and that's all she does. Whereas other bees are born, to, born into the nest and they have multiple jobs through their lives. So this little film that I'm gonna show you now I filmed in Tokai, um, these are your bees, um, on Saturday. And this is a, a, a resin collecting bee and she's on the, the repens. I've slowed the film down because it's an extraordinary um, film to see how she collects the resin. Remember that this resin is supposedly to repel insects and um, here she is harvesting it. So she uses her mandibles and she does this sort of zigzag motion to and fro and her antennae, bees taste with their antennae and feel with their antennae. Bees are deaf, they feel vibrations and they feel sound. That's why they have hairs in their eyes. So here she is harvesting the um, resins. Here's another angle of it. Look how close her antennae are to, to her mandibles as she's sensing exactly where the, the resin is. She makes a ball and then she'll pass it back um, to her hind leg, which she'll pat it onto specially designed hairs, which they normally carry pollen in these little baskets, but it also um, helps her to collect the resin. Now she, when she gets back to the nest, she can't take it off herself. She has to wait for another house bee to help her remove the resin. It's just too sticky, but it's an incredibly difficult job. That is the real speed now. That's how quick she does it. Um, I thought I'd show you. So next time you ask, go and have a look and see. The interesting thing was um, we didn't see any bees harvesting resins from the pine trees. Um, they prefer the proteus and other um, indigenous plants. So from there, um, this little video shows how the bees will actually prepare the surface um, before they they apply the resin. Um, so the resin is, is mixed with wax um, and it has other um, properties in it from the bees. And that's a really interesting thing to, to study is, is what the makeup is in terms of the resins, where, where they're putting them. So if there's a front wall, there are more protea resins in the front wall because that has a fire retardant to it when the bees add their enzymes to it. So in this image here, you will see rows and rows of bees using their mandibles to scrape the rocks. And the bees are covered in little flakes um, from the rocks. They're cleaning the rock um, before they will apply the, the propolis. So it's, it's a job done by many, and it has a very similar motion to when they are actually maintaining the propolis, which I'll show you in the next video. So if you just have a look at those mandibles coming over the edge of that little, um, ledge there. And then here's another um, shot of them all together. So they scrape with their front legs and they scrape with their mandibles. They're clearing that surface and also scratching the surface so that the resins um, and propolis will apply to the surface. 
So once they have prepared the surface, they then apply the propolis. And this propolis um, is applied in this manner. Every day, they will come and add new resins to the propolis. And that's because these resins have essential oils. This is a social species. They're touching each other the whole time. And what have we learned in COVID? That we have to wash our hands and we have to keep our distance if we're going to pass on um, COVID to one another. The bees know about pathogens and um, that's their biggest threat. Um, and so this is how they, they prepare the, the, their nest to be resilient is they apply this propolis that every day they work it in that manner. So it's moist and the essential oils um, come to the surface. And when the bees leave, they whack them down themselves down with the essential oils. And when they arrive back from foraging, they whack themselves down again. So they know how to sanitize. And they've been doing this for 80 million years. So they really do know how to survive when there are threats from things like pathogens that we're still having to learn about. So of course, <clears throat> a nest area is, is an incredibly interesting area in that it it's an entire habitat of all kinds of other creatures. And in this image, you will see the red-sided skinks. Um, they often come into the nests and eat the wax moth and um, the bees have no problem with the red-sided skinks coming in and eating the wax moth. In this particular nest, this skinx visits at least four times a day to see if it can um, collect a, a moth up and eat it. Um, a guard bee will come and see who it is and then let, let the, the skinks in. If the bees are in a mood, they might chase it off and the skinks will leave quickly. The other little creatures that you're seeing are pseudoscorpions. They are often referred to as book scorpions, but pseudoscorpions don't have a, uh, a sting and they're tiny. They ride on the, the bees' legs. Um, they wait on flowers. And when the bees visit the flowers, they'll clamp onto the bees' leg. They don't damage the bee. And they, they're much older species than honeybees. But this particular species has evolved with honeybees. They live in the nests and they perform incredible functions with the bees. And the bees um, have an incredible relationship with the pseudoscorpions. Whenever they move to another um, nest site, they will take the pseudoscorpions with them. And they're very, very important. They eat um, wax moth larvae and wax moth eggs. And wax moth plays a very important role in the colony of bees. As its name suggests, it eats wax. And um, when there's old wax, an old comb that needs to be gotten rid of, the honeybees will let the wax moth um, come in and eat that away. And then they will maintain the number of, of wax moth by feeding the larvae and eggs to the pseudoscorpions. Um, there are many, many species that live inside a, a nest. It is an entire city of mutual um, relationships between one another. And this is not what you find inside a hive. But in a wild nest, this is a dynamic space and it's absolutely incredible to, to watch. Unfortunately, all of these things are really tiny. So one's got to be able to um, get up really close and see the relationships. So in this video, I want to show you, and unfortunately I can't use my cursor to, to give directions. It's, oh, there it is, I, I can use it. Can you, hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, I'm going to describe the video before I play it. Um, hopefully you can see the cursor. That white thing is a feather. Just underneath the feather, a bee is going to come out and there's a pseudoscorpion. Um, there's a pseudoscorpion there. Pseudoscorpions can only tell light and, and dark. They, they don't um, have a eyesight. So they, they have big pincers with hairs on the pincers that can feel their way around. So what's going to happen is this area here in front of the feather is a feeding station. The honeybees are busy cleaning out the number of um, wax moth eggs and larvae from underneath the colony. That's the colony hanging there. And um, a bee's gonna come out and she's gonna drop an egg. The pseudoscorpion doesn't know where the egg is. As the bee turns around, 
the pseudo scorpion is going to grab the bee by her leg and pull her and say, hey, where did you put that? The bee is going to come back and nudge that pseudo scorpion twice in the direction of where the egg is. So let's go. I've slowed the video down. Here she comes now. She's got an egg in her mandibles here. And there's the pseudo scorpion. She's standing on the pseudo scorpion now. She's just dropped the egg. There is the pseudo scorpion there. So she turns around, she wipes herself. She doesn't like the taste of the egg. And she's about to leave and the pseudo scorpion grabs her by the leg right there. She turns around and she nudges the pseudo scorpion with the antennae and she'll do it again. There we go. Again, the pseudo scorpion reaches up and touches her antennae. And here comes the pseudo scorpion now to find the egg. There's another pseudo scorpion underneath the, the feather and here comes here come more eggs so you have these feeding stations um, you also have cleaning stations where the pseudo scorpions will um, check the bees if there are any um, parasites on the bees any mites on the bees the pseudo scorpions will pull them off and eat them so this is an incredibly important creature to the honeybees and they cannot live inside a hive they can they need to have leaf litter and and um, soil to live in and they are super super important in terms of the health of a, a wild colony so of course honeybees fit into the food web um, many many creatures eat honeybees this particular lizard um, is one of our favorite characters and um, is called tailless for obvious reasons and every time we get close to this colony to um, film, we get up really close, we don't wear bee suits or anything, we listen to the sounds of the bees and if we accept it, we can come up close. So we, we would probably be about 20 centimeters away from, from the colony. This lizard will, will use us as a decoy and rush at the colony and leap up and grab a bee from the colony. We have to duck <laughs> quite quickly because there'll be about 50 guards coming out after the lizard. Luckily, bees can clearly distinguish um, a sense of smell. We don't smell like that lizard. So they go after the lizard. And um, if they get the lizard, which is they sometimes do, this is Taylor's getting stung. And um, if they get the lizard in the eye, the lizard will die. We've found some dead lizards with bee stings in the eye. So the bees are going for, for the sensitive parts, but they will sting it um, wherever they can. And after a few stings, tailors will disappear. So again, the food web, many, many creatures eat um, honeybees. They're very important in terms of um, the food web out there um, from spiders. Spiders know the flight paths of bees, will make their webs and the bees get caught in them. Um, up at the top um, right-hand corner is a bee wolf wasp that feeds its um, young um, fresh bees that it stings and just um, paralyzes them, lays its egg um, on that bee inside its own burrow in the ground. And that's the food for, for the bee wolf wasp. And of course, many bird species eat um, honeybees. And what you have down the bottom there is the sugar bird. The sugar birds are really clever. They wait until the bees have been out foraging. So they're filled with nectar. So when they catch the bees, they get a really sweet taste. But most of the birds, except for the fork-tailed drongo, have to knock out the stings when they catch the, the honeybees. So drones don't have stings, so they are a really popular source of food with the birds. I want to just move into a, a more um, interesting thing that during the big lockdown, um, I was photographing um, this particular thing, which I, I wanted to demonstrate to people the difference between honeybees and the solitary bees um, in terms of um, the pollination that happens. Um, honeybees aren't necessarily the best pollinators. There are a lot of honeybees out there because um, the colonies are much bigger than um, the amount of solitary bees or semi-social bees that you'll find. But the, the honeybees do something that is quite different from, from the solitary bees. When they pick up pollen, they pack it onto their hind leg, but honeybees are very um, efficient in terms of how they carry pollen. 
and um, they want to carry everything. Um, they don't want to drop anything. And so what they've, they do is they suck up nectar and that's a nectar bubble that you see where the, the arrow is and they will regurgitate nectar uh, and they will pass it back and pack the pollen with nectar. So here's a very slow video of, of the bee actually doing it. So here she is, she actually flies off the flower. So she's not gonna drop anything onto the flower as well. There she is regurgitating nectar now and she's packing it onto the pollen at the back on her hind leg on the pollen basket. So this is quite a different thing um, to the, the other pollinators that carry dry pollen. So the success rate of pollination from honeybees isn't that high um, because as you can see, she's taken herself off the flower and she's also adding uh, moisture nectar in this case to the pollen that she's carrying because she doesn't want to lose any of it she wants to take all of it back to her colony to her nest here we go she's regurgitating another little bit of um, nectar and packing it onto the pollen so often if you have time um, and if you're watching insects it takes a lot of time just sit um, if you have to go into another lockdown just sit and have a look you'll see them lift off the flowers and look very um, carefully and um, they do it very very quickly um, she'll be packing the pollen with nectar. So the video that I'm going to show you now is a solitary bee um, and how she collects pollen. This is Kelletti's carpensis, and this is how she would be collecting pollen. No nectar is added. She's busy um, with the head right down there getting nectar um, from the nectaries, but at the same time, she's picking up um, pollen. So she's full of dry pollen. She's dropping it everywhere. These are the good pollinators. Their success rate in terms of pollination is like 95%, um, sort of compared to, and figures are very difficult to quote, but um, some of the figures in terms of honeybee pollination success is around 15% compared to a 95% because of the dry pollen that they carry. So I wanted to just come back to to this image, which I showed you at the beginning. Um, and hopefully now you will have a greater sense of what I meant by habitat loss, because I was listening to the opening of, of your um, AGM today. And, and one of the quotes was about the greatest threat to um, conservation is people's opinion. And this is our greatest threat that we face um, in terms of um, working with wild colonies is the perception that a hive is, is a good habitat or a good home for, for honeybees. It's not. Um, as you can see, they lose all the vibrancy of the, the nest city. Um, and that is their natural way of being, um, to live with many other organisms in a mutually beneficial way. So this is what we mean when we talk about habitat loss when it comes to honeybees. And I want to move into your environment that we visited on Saturday. And <clears throat> this is also a habitat loss as, as we see it when we were walking around um, in the low Tokai area. Um, when one looks for um, the species that live in this environment. I think we saw one wasp flying through here while we were walking around. This is also a major habitat loss. It's very similar to the hive, in fact, that people have a perception that this environment is, is a, a healthy environment in terms of um, species and, and, and life. It's not, it has a very limited amount of life in this environment compared to this environment. And he has an image of me photographing carpenter bee. Um, and that's the photograph and just enjoying all the different species um, that we saw in the short amount of time that we spent in, in the park. There the honeybees were collecting the resin and we were happy to see all the holes in, in the wood around made by beetles and know that um, that will be beautiful homes for the solitary bees when they move into those holes soon. Um, so I wanted to end um, with this. Let's keep our wild honeybees in the wild and preserve our fangos. 
because that is the truest statement that we can have in terms of biodiversity. If we start messing with um, removing things and thinking that certain things are important to um, the environment and they're not indigenous, um, they're going to cause a lot of problems. So I hope I've kept to my time. Um, I know that sometimes I can talk for a lot longer, but I think I'll be open to questions if that's okay. Thank you very much, Jenny. Wow, what a treat. That was fantastic. <laughs> I'm just waiting for our chair. Um, if you would like to come on and just um, say a quick word of thanks, and then we'll move into questions, as you say. Thank you, Jenny. That was brilliant. Fascinating how um, in the wild, it's so diverse and so um, detailed. Um, but you, you mentioned the propolis, but it's, it seems to be a curtain on the outside of the hive. Um, I presume it does other things than, than keep the wind. It'll be keeping out predators, it'll be keeping out um, moisture, keeping out fire. Um, what else does it do? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's a nest, not a hive. Um, so it's it has multiple um, functions, as you say. It can actually let um, moisture out because a, a, a colony is, um, the nest environment is very humid. It's around 70% humidity in there. So propolis will allow moisture out, but it won't allow moisture in. Um, it, it acts quite often when we look at some of the nests, um, the propolis um, almost looks like the rock. So it can be a camouflage. It's, it's a fire retardant. Um, it can take up to about 100 degrees heat um, on the outer walls. So it is, it's their primary immune skin layer. Um, so that is a very important aspect of it. Um, it does um, help them maintain temperature as well. And certainly in terms of predators, um, they use it. So if a colony is in a temporary situation um, and let's say they make a, a nest um, with comb a temporary um, situation, four months or so, and it's in sticks. Um, we've seen this when they're dealing with um, certain problems, like um, in, in areas in the Nurhuk area where they're dealing with varroa mite and they've, they've left a, a hive and they, they set up um, in, in a bush for a while, four months or so, then they'll put propolis on every single stick um, that's, that joins the, the comb. So they disinfect every area. Um, it's, it has extraordinary um, qualities to it. So not only that, if you imagine 35 degree heat inside the nest and all of those volatiles, all of those essential oils are releasing. So when the bees are breathing, they are breathing that into their system as well, all the essential oils. And there are over 300 or so essential oils um, probably in those propolis on the floor, on the walls, everywhere in the wild nests. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Alana has a question. Did you find the bee nest at Takai? Was it in rocks? No, I, we haven't um, found, found, we haven't spent enough time um, looking, but as soon as we do, we will let you know when we when we found them. But we've certainly seen enough honeybees around to, we know that in that area, there are a lot in the trees, um, wild colonies that we often get called to along the roadside and that, but they definitely will be probably in the upper upper areas. Um, so maybe in your hacking um, groups, they can let us know when they do find, and we'd love to come out and see what's happening with your wild bees there. Okay, cool, we will. Um, another question from Alana, can solitary bees sting? Yes, they can. Um, all, all female bees can sting, none of the drones can. So none of the male um, bees of, um, honeybees or solitary bees can sting, but um, solitary bees can, can certainly sting. Um, but they don't, you know, the only time that you, they're going to sting you is when you sort of trap them and um, they're frightened or you stand on them and you didn't know they were there. It's, there are very few people that I know of that have been stung by solitary bees. Okay. Um, Ian Preston would like to know, um... What is your view of the so-called bee hotels? Um, 
I think uh, B hotels are, are, are the international ones aren't really um, great for our country. Those are the ones with the lots of little sticks. Um, I would just take a log um, and mimic what the what the beetles do. Um, a couple of holes um, in the log, and if you want to know the sizes, the drill bit sizes, it would be a, a number one, a number three, a number five, and number seven. Those those are great hole sizes for for um, to drill into your log. Not not lots of them because the moment you have um, a lot of um, holes in one area, you're going to get the wasps coming and predating on on the solitary bee. So you basically turning a hotel into a restaurant for another species. So the smaller they are and move them, put them in different um, spaces in your garden, make sure that they have quite a lot of sun um, for the solitary bees. So, um, you know, these, these little blocks of wood with lots of holes in them, um, make sure that the wood is not treated. Um, I would prefer people to make them themselves. So take a little piece of wood, preferably a log and just drill some holes and put it in a nice dry warm space in your garden and um, north facing is great and um, you will find the, the leaf cutters in there and um, the cellophane bees will come in there quite quickly but you also might find some of the the dauber wasps in there too so um, it's always interesting to see who moves into them but those giant um, insect hotels are a no-no because they you know, they end up by just having spiders living in them um, and catching anything else that comes in there. So little ones, the smaller, the better, and move them around your garden, put them in different areas. Thank you. Um, Angela Niehaus has a comment. Um, she says, I have two box eyes in my garden and just put up a bee hotel in my tree. So that was a very interesting talk. Um, and Ian Preston um, has a question. Periodic fires are important for Fainbull's health. What is the impact of fires on bees' nests? That's a really great question. Um, honeybees in, in the Western Cape um, have evolved with fire. So this is the really interesting thing. They select their nest site in terms of what will survive fire. And the propolis wall on the outside, um, they'll be choosing particular resins um, to use, knowing that fire will come through at some point. So that's what is the main determining factor in terms of um, the amount of, of colonies that you will find in, in the Fenbos region. So we're seeing probably one colony per square kilometer um, in a pristine area. And, um, and that's all got to do with um, the choice of nest site that will survive fire. If they don't um, choose according to that, that, that they will perish. So most of our nest sites um, in Cape Point, we've, we've gone through three fires since um, we started research. So about 85% um, of our nest site, sites um, have survived um, fires. And it's after the fire that the bees might go under stress in terms of forage, and they might then abscond later. So the important thing to remember is a, is a queen cannot fly um, when a fire comes through, she, if queens are going to fly, they need to starve her for about three days. She has to stop laying. So she's very, very um, filled with eggs and gravit. She cannot fly. Um, so fires come through without warning. So the bees have to make choices about nest sites that will survive fire. And that allows for our environments to have not an over, um, not overpopulated with honeybees. It's a very, very, very important um, point in terms of um, the balance in nature is that honeybees are only going to choose those nest sites and will only um, put out new colonies. Honeybees breed by creating a whole new colony. They'll only put out a, a new colony when there is a vacancy in terms of one of those nest sites. Otherwise, that's not um, sensible for them to do that. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, um, Vard wants to know if um, solitary bees also have barbs on their things. No, they don't. So they can sting you multiple times. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but they don't unless you trap them. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alana um, asks, um, she's always curious about the impact of domestic honeybees being brought into Fainbos areas. 
and the, the potential impacts of it. Do we know anything more about the impacts? Um, a few years ago at the Fainville Forum, you mentioned we only really had anecdotal evidence. Um, any students working on this? Um, and how is the movement of domestic honeybees regulated in South Africa, especially in the Western Cape? Well, I think, I think that um, I don't know of anybody working on it, but I mean, I've seen firsthand um, in terms of research areas when in the Clan Karoo and watching um, being in a reserve and then the farm next door brings in the pollination units and um, in the Clan Karoo, what, what you have is it's the biggest seed producing area in South Africa. So um, I think the farm that was next door to the reserve that I was in um, was doing seed for onions and carrots so they brought in honeybees and they bring in a lot of of, of colonies and there are there there were no other flowers really available i was in a tiny patch of flowers with this incredibly peaceful relationship with probably 25 different species of of bees um, feeding on these flowers and then the honeybees arrived and of course those honeybees are hungry and the hybridized um, onions and carrots are not producing nectar because they've been hybridized. So the bees are now looking for wildflowers. So honeybees can get up early. They're maintaining a temperature. Solitary bees get up when, when they're warm enough to, to leave their, their burrows or their nest site. And um, so the honeybees come through and they take the pollen and the nectar before the solitary bees come through. So it was a, a very devastating thing to see that the solitary bees came um, through the next morning when the honeybees had found their flowers and there was nothing left for them and you could see the distress so then the male solitary bees started attacking the honeybees and it was it was quite an interesting dynamic to watch i must go back and film it um but COVID messed that up this last year but i'll hopefully go this year and film it again um if one imagines um that simple equation of a balanced environment has one colony per square kilometer if you put 25 hives on the border of a, of a, a reserve, um, to use very simple terminology, you'll have overgrazing um, of the floral resources. And it won't just be the solitary bees that will be impacted on, it'll be the butterflies, it'll be all the pollinators, it'll be the birds. Um, honeybees are, are hard workers. They, they go out and they, um, they go and they're completely reliant on flowers for, for their food, for pollen and nectar. So they will arrive and of course, humans are taking their food, they harvest the honey. So what happens is the colonies are focused on making uh, a lot of food. Um, in the wild, our, our nest sites are small, they're, they're not big spaces. So we talk in liters. So we'd look at about 35 liters, 25 liters is a average sort of space for, for a wild colony. Uh, a box, um, a brood box uh, and a hive, the bottom section is 40 liters and then, then there's a super box put on top of that that's another large amount of space the colony grows bigger than it should be and humans are harvesting the the honey the reason why the the little box is put on top is to make surplus honey that is incorrect a colony grows downwards doesn't grow upwards so we've already inverted that there's a steel sort of frame that um, or netting the queen cannot go up into the top layer and lay so that space above the colony um, brood the babies creates air and it changes the temperature so the bees produce a lot more bees to fill that box with wax and and honey so that they can maintain the temperature of the whole colony then people come and harvest that and what that does is it makes the honeybee focused in in hives they're very very focused on producing a lot of honey and um, that means they go into competition much more than they would in in a in a wild colony because in the wild colony they only make what their family needs they don't have to make honey for somebody who's harvesting it so i don't know there have been studies in other parts of the world about the impact of uh, domestic bees um, there are quite a few of them out at the moment about the d impact of domestic bees on the, the solitary bees and the semi-social bees and on other pollinators. And it all indicates um, it's a simple maths equation, quite simply. Um, too many mouths to feed. You bring in 25 hives, that's a million mouths to feed. Um, on a resource, 
the thing that people don't really understand is there are wild bees in every reserve in South Africa. The, the space is accounted for already for um, the wild colonies. It's in perfect balance with all the other pollinators. Bring in hives or you put hives on the border. Bees don't know um, there's a borderline there. They fly in and find the forage and they, they feed on it. So it's, it is quite a simple math equation um, that you bring in 25 hives, it's a million mouths to feed, you're going to outcompete other species and um, interfere with the very sensitive pollination networks. So in terms of regulation, there isn't any regulation around where you can put your hives. We've currently formed a committee, it's called Working for Pollinators, um, we, there's a, the umbrella organization is Conservation at Work. Um, Liz Eglinton is the chairperson of that committee. I'm the vice chair and the project coordinator. And we're looking at um, how we can address these issues. Um, we have all the major conservation bodies on board and um, from Sandparks to Sandby to um, Cape Nature and all the private um, reserves, a lot of the private reserves are, are on board. And we have a committee we've recently formed and we will hopefully be able to look at um, corridors around conservation areas that we can protect the pollination networks that occur inside the reserve by having the dialogue with private landowners um, around particularly um, spraying and and the number of hives. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Clo Mashashlela has um, just pointed out that they've got two projects on this matter um, in the Western Cape, one funded through Sandby with Kaput um, and the other through Stellenbosch and Ark. And these are master's projects. So yeah, we'll watch that space with interest. Um, we also have a question um, from Ian Preston um, I'm just trying to find it now. It was on Cape Point. Um, how many nest sites have you found at Cape Point? Um, are you allowed to tell us? <laughs> yes, I am allowed to tell you. Um, we have 96 so far. Um, we haven't walked every inch. Um, that's, we've done most of, most of the reserve. Um, I'm not allowed to tell you where they are. And that's, that information is is. is it's very important that, that we do not ever reveal where the, the nest sites are. Not all of the nest sites are occupied. So there are 96 um, nest sites that we've found, but there's movement. So um, we may have found some and a fire goes through, then they move off. A couple of years later, the nest is reoccupied by others. So that is um, what we've seen in terms of the population size is about one per square kilometer in, in terms of the reserve. 77 square kilometers. Um, so yeah, they're not all occupied. Cool, thank you. Okay, I'm going to start closing the questions. We still got lots of questions coming in, Jenny. Everyone is really excited by your talk. Um, Ian Preston again asked, people promote gum trees for honeybees. And what impact does the proportion of gum trees for honeybees have on the solitary bees and wild honeybees? You know, I, I don't um, do research around gum trees. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's an interesting question in that I think that beekeepers need to um, feed their bees. And if they have um, bees on, on um, private land and on farms and gum trees um, have a lot of um, nectar, I think in Australia, the gum trees are feeding birds and bats. Um, so they produce a lot of nectar and um, I think that those, that's a good source of food for, for um, domestic bees. Um, but our wild bees are, are better off with a diverse um, indigenous um, food source. So if I were talking to beekeepers, and I think that beekeepers need to feed their bees and not rely on natural environments for their food source, then they need to um, have areas where they... Um, will create forage areas for their bees. And that needs to be done on, um, in farm areas and not in um, any areas that's going to be um, near indigenous um, environments. So 
certainly we're never going to move away from beekeeping, um, but it's a, a very different topic to, to what I, I like to talk about. But I do believe beekeepers need to feed their bees um, and they need to feed them in an area that is designed for their, their food. And nobody should keep an animal and not feed it. Nobody should keep a creature and expect somebody else to feed it. And that's often the case is the beekeepers put their bees right on conservation borders because they're not prepared to feed their bees. And I don't mean feeding your bees honey water or sugar water. I mean a floral source and a diverse floral source. So that is a very, very important um, issue that needs to be addressed within the beekeeping association. I have nothing to do with the beekeeping association. I'm in conservation. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Last question then um, from Philippa Klima. Um, we removed a beehive after nine months in our garden when we saw a few solitary bees. Is there research on bee varieties in urban gardens? And she just notes that keeping a garden dry helps. Um, I'm not aware of um, research in terms of um, one's own garden um, in terms of solitary bees, but I think it's I think what we would like um, to inspire people to do is to um, like bird watching, do bee watching and see what, what happens in your garden. Um, different times of the year, different solitary bees, different um, semi-social bees are out. Um, have a look at, at, at a couple of things when you see them. What time of the day is it? What temperature and, and what flowers are they on? And if you do this quite regularly in your own garden, I remember in lockdown, I had a little graph going, just bee to bush. And I, I clocked every hour and I was counting the honeybees and I was counting the solitary bees. And, and if I looked at honeybees were there early in the morning and then during midday they dropped off and in the afternoon they were back foraging. And the solitary bees were mostly there in the midday when the, and the honeybees weren't there. So just fun things to do. Um, so there isn't a lot of information necessarily about, um, I mean, there isn't a guide in South Africa. There's that um, poster, I think, of um, solitary bees that's out there on the, on the internet, but there isn't a field guide for, for bees um, in South Africa. It's desperately needed. And um, one would hope that Connell Early would do something, um, make a field guide, um, but it's, we're still um, discovering um, solitary bees. Um, we work with an international taxonomist and he says he can't sleep at night because of the number of, of solitary bees that still have to be discovered in South Africa that are getting lost um, through extinction and through habitat loss and um, impact on, of pesticides. So we're losing species before we even know they're there. So it's important that more and more people get involved with um, appreciating um, solitary bees and, um, and all the bees and just becoming aware of them, post the pictures of them, um, write to people um, who are involved in, in um, research of, of solitary bees, get them identified, collect your own, your own um, little book of, of, or on your computer of what you've seen. And of course, I naturalist, you can post there and um, that data is a very, very important. Um, globally, we're losing our insects. And um, I think it's a big wake up call because people talk about the loss of honeybees. And, you know, what they're talking about is, is, is um, the domestic honeybees that, that are, are dying. And um, as I've pointed out, we've moved them out of their habitat and that is making them susceptible to disease and what we put them through is causing millions of die off. Um, that is our, on our head and on our conscience. And so we certainly need to protect our, our wild honeybees from um, any more damage that, that we impose on them. Thank you, Jenny. That has been most exciting and most entertaining and a very interesting talk. Um, and I like your suggestion that um, we go and record what's in our gardens and we can put it on iNaturalist and we can do it as part of the City Nature Challenge. And of course, there's no reason to stop afterwards. We can continue recording um, and get an idea of the, of the bees in our garden and get an appreciation for it. I'm correct, we're one of the areas of bee richness in the world, one of yes. the richest areas. So yes. yeah, we are a center of bee diversity. So 
yeah, very important that we actually learn and find out more about our bees. Jenny, that was absolutely fantastic. We love your work. And um, I guess some of us are envious for most days when you're out there eight <laughs> hours a day, um, six days a week at, at Cape Point. Although I guess when the wind is blowing, um, I suppose you don't do that much work. I presume the bees are a bit slower then as well. No, actually, um, the very experienced workers will be flying. And um, of course, nest sites are... are take that wind into consideration being the windiest place on the continent of Africa those uh -huh. bees know how to fly and so we have probably on average 15 wind still days in Cape Point and like the bees have adapted we've also adapted to the wind so we also know where to go where when it's 40 knots um, how to keep out of that wind there are many nest uh -huh. sites that are out of the wind and so we can go and um, observe them your bees seem almost as hard working as you um, Jenny, thanks. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. We love it. Um, and good luck with your research. And maybe thanks. in a few years' time, we'll ask you to come and give us another talk and update us on, on what the fascinating discoveries you're making. Yeah, and maybe Thank we'll do much. solitary bees next time. Great. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks for the invite. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Bye. Bye. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, just for everybody else's benefit, just to remind everyone again that um, Jenny and Ujubi is all self-funded. So um, they're doing absolutely amazing work and very important work. So please do consider making a donation. Um, we'll be making a donation just to say thank you for, um, for presenting to us today. I, I've shared their websites in the chat box, so you can copy that out. Um, ujubi.com and you can go and have a look at all of the, her fantastic photos and art maybe you'd like to buy some of the sculptures as well so yeah please do support them and then uh, just a reminder as well about our conservation work at Friends of Sakai Park we also really need support so if you've got ideas um, peop, uh, big funders or ideas of um, in-kind donations please do get in touch with us so yeah thank you very much to everybody and on that note um, we'll formally close the meeting for tonight. Thank you for coming.